Hello and welcome to Creative Outcomes. I'm one. I'm Ryan Watson. I'm one of the founding port partners here at Upsourced. I am joined today by Sean Donahue, Senior Controller, Client Service Extraordinaire here at Upsourced. Sean, say hey. Thank you for the warm introduction. Yes, uh, happy to be involved on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, we've had you a couple of times. Uh, one of our uh, one of our high uh, high batting average pinch hitters. Uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, thanks for joining. So, so Sean, one, one of the topics that, uh, and this is kind of like a request from the audience, a thing that has come up a couple of times that we thought, you know what, let's just start the cameras and click record and let's address this. And the, that question is generally, uh, you, you know, the classic, and we, we dealt with this a lot in 2023 and unfortunately we're still hearing it in 2024, which is, Hey, I'm losing some money. I'm not hitting my profit targets. I need to get lean. How do I do it? And unfortunately, you and I spent a lot of our time answering exactly this kind of question. So why don't we answer it for everybody else? So, Sean, why don't I give the mic to you first, which is when you get that question, wh where do you start? Like, what's the waterfall of things that you look at to try to figure out where can this client cut some money? Yeah. And this is an easy muscle to flex right now because, unfortunately, we are answering it pretty frequently and more than we would like to. Um, you, know, you don't need a CFO to tell you to make sure that we're just keeping overall OPEX in, in line, right? So the first thing is like, check off our low hanging fruit of operating expenses. So are we spending too much on travel? That's not necessary. Are we having lots of off sites and all these other frivolous spendings that maybe make sense when we're, you know, crushing it from a sales perspective, but don't make a ton of sense when, uh, when we need to tighten the strings. And then additionally, like we want to make sure we're only paying contractors or any other sort of freelancers when we can't utilize the internal team, right? Because obviously we don't want to get to the point of cutting headcount. Uh, so to delay that as much as possible and make sure we don't have to, we look at the OPEX, make sure our overhead spend is within line. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, you know, I, I think as you would agree, it, there's, it's, it's probably not often the case that there's like a ton of low hanging fruit sitting around. But obviously, if there is, I, mean, I would say, and I don't, I don't know if you can think of examples like this, I, I'd say if there is ever any of these, and by the way, saying this isn't necessarily very self-serving for a firm like ours, but I'll say it anyway, which is if there are examples like this, it's really a function of, I've got to, you know, there's this tendency, the business isn't going really well, I feel anxious, I feel unsuccessful, I feel like I don't necessarily have a lot of answers, I know what I'll do. I'll hire a series of consultants who are going to come and bring silver bullets to me and help me solve my problems. And the reality is that is rarely the case. In general, you know, the like having creating more efficiency or improving your operations, these are not often the things that are going to dig you out. In most cases, we're dealing with agencies that have sales problems. They have, you know, revenue generating problems. And for them, bringing on more consultants to look at this area of the business or that, it may feel productive, but it's probably a waste of money in that exact moment. Yeah, and oftentimes distracting. Yeah, it's kind of distracting too, right? Like I think this is the time when, when you need to tighten the strings, you want to align on the North Star and really focus on what matters. And sometimes the extra noise and all the extra spending, it, it really takes away from what we need to focus on. Yeah, totally agree. So anyway, that, that does exist. And I can think of a handful of instances where we've, we've tried to solve problems like that. But all right, so let's just say, yeah, we've gone through OPEX. I mean, the, look, the, the, the bottom line is like, you know, that I've, I've always said, like, if you're going to make, you know, if, if you have, uh, if you're trying to make a profit and uh, you have a bad gross margin, it really doesn't matter what your OPEX is, you're not going to make any money, right? And if you have a good gross margin, it really doesn't matter. Like the OPEX part is easy. So anyway, it's often untrue that like there's a real lever here at the operating expense. So anyways, if we move past that, yeah, not one that's going to really move the needle, right? When you go through the exercise, sure, we might find a couple thousand dollars here and there that are now we deem unnecessary, but so let's say pass. We pass, we check OPEX, we're not overspending, right? Now we are a service business. So next thing we look at of what we do, do we make money off of it, right? So we're looking at project margin on the, the revenue that we're actually servicing. So I need to know, this is what I'm doing. This is my core offering. Am I making a good profit margin on that? The answer is yes. Cool. We can check that box. Now we want to look at how utilized are we have people on the bench. 
The answer is no. We're probably going to need multiple more podcasts to really cover exactly what that might mean, right? If it's no, it's like, are we over-servicing just because there's not sales there? And so we're saying, hey, we have this revenue here. We got to make sure that we we knock it out of the park. That that has like other bad implications down the line, right? Yeah. So I, I think if I'm hearing you correctly, if I move past OPEX, then I come to the meat of the agency, which is gross margin. And gross margin is a function of project profit and utilization. So when I have work, am I making money on the work I'm doing? And utilization tells me, or, or excess capacity is, how much money am I spending for people who aren't doing work, right? And so those two things together sort of tell me, am I going to make a gross margin or not? On the project margin side, exactly. Like if we're, if we're, if we are not making money on the project management side, the, the, the way to improve my sort of the way to cut costs or the way to, to, to make more money is it could be a myriad of reasons, right? Like ultimately trying to solve project margin requires a more intense evaluation. So there's no low hanging fruit there. But I think you would agree, Sean, that like if we think about the kind of clients who are coming to us with those questions, it's not as often that their problem lives in OPEX or in project margin. Unfortunately, it's the most common that their problem lives in utilization. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. Uh, it would be utilization. And oftentimes part of that is understanding what hours we're ending up billing, right? I think as we've dug into this with a lot of clients that are really struggling to hit that, like, that margin that they need, is that we're not really capturing all of our service hours per se, or that there are some inefficiencies within the team to where we really, until you look at it very closely, you don't realize how many hours you're, I don't know the right word, writing off, but we're not actually ended up billing for it, right? And so now is the time where we need to get ahead of those things and really understand what's going on within our business that's resulting in us not being able to bill that many hours. Right. So, so all that to say, the majority of the time we run this waterfall, we find ourselves to the position where this agency has a utilization problem. It's the, it's not that we're spending frivolously on rent. Most of our agencies are distributed. It's not that we can't, we're not making money on the projects when we have them. Quite frankly, it's that we don't have enough projects for the people we have. We don't have enough work for the people that we have hired to do the work. So I, I mean, I, I, I would say, um, and by the way, this is just super common. Like, uh, you know, I don't know what you, so Sean is our benchmarking guru and I'm going to ask you to try to come up with a number off the top of your head. Uh, and you're not going to know it, but you can probably approximate it. So we benchmark a lot of metrics across agencies, one of which is like raw utilization. So what is, you know, what, what, what is the sort of average utilization within our, within our agencies? And we like to talk about like blended utilizations, uh, in the like 60 to 65%, uh, range. How many agencies do we work with that don't have that? I mean, it's a substantial percentage of folks that we see, correct? Yeah. I mean, I would say probably the majority. It's it's definitely trended in the wrong direction um, in the last maybe couple of quarters, which is part of why we're having this, this podcast, right? Uh, so yeah, it's trended in the wrong direction because, I mean, what is the least fun thing to do as an agency owner? It's, you know, it's having to make the really uncomfortable, hard decision of our biggest costs are people. And that's the reality of it. Right. And if our costs aren't being used, you know, it's not, we're not going to rent a, we're not going to rent a machine and not use it, or we're not going to whatever it may be. It's like, we can't, it's just the hardest part. So we, we have these, we have these things that service our revenue and we just have too many of them. And so that's kind of the next thing you have to move to. Yeah, it's the most common problem. And I would say, I would submit there's two main reasons why this is a thing. I mean, again, if you are listening to this and you're like, oh my gosh, that's, that might be me. You're in great company, as we said. And I think there's two reasons why. One is just the fear factor of making a really hard decision. Like, as Sean said, it's the least fun thing to do as a business owner. And you feel this, you know, on top of it just being like, I don't want to have an uncomfortable conversation and deliver somebody some bad news. I think there's some extra fear about, well, what happens to those who remain? Am I going to tank the culture? Am I going to erode the loyalty? Is you know, is everybody going to say, "Oh no, it's a, sh a sinking ship. I better get out of here"? 
I'd say that's probably one of the main reasons. The other reason is optimism. Like entrepreneurs are optimists. That's you, you, we have to be optimists because if we weren't optimists, if we were realists or pessimists, we would just have jobs. <laughs> like if we had, you know, if, if we, if we looked at our business through like a, you know, a, a net present value calculation, we would say, Hey, on average, I'm going to make less money doing this than I would make in a job, except we all see the upside of doing this is far greater than having, than having a job. And we are optimists. We think we are the outliers. We think we can go get the upside. And so that's how we see the world. And, and we're all that way. And that's great, except when you're having to make operational decisions about how to run your agency. You want to take your optimistic glasses off and put your realist glasses on. And, and, uh, and, and many don't. And for that reason, we often hear, well, uh, yeah, our utilization is really poor, but the pipeline, the pipeline, it's so good. I got opportunities. Things are happening. But, you know, look, sitting in our chair, we hear that month after month after month after month. And I don't mean that in a derisive way. I just mean that in a, we're optimists. So we see the like glass half full in every opportunity rather than, you know, applying some real objective weighting to what's in the pipeline and asking ourselves, what's the real probability based on history of these things materializing? So anyways, I don't know. Does that sound right to you? Those, would you say those are the two primarily factors? It, it does. And, and, you know, I wouldn't, it's hard. I can't blame any of the, any of agency owners for feeling the optimist part, especially when you think about, we talk about the life cycle of agencies. And I mean, most agency owners have gotten to where we are with organic growth, just word of mouth. And like things have just kind of blossomed, right? And retainers have grown or whatever it may be. So you've, we've gotten here without needing the perfect visibility and without having to really lay people off historically. So we're used to that optimism kind of working. And when things get tough, it's, you got to kind of move past that. And I think a message that we tell our clients a lot, and I, I don't think it's lip service, it's true, is we want to reward our employees and build this business around our core team. And the company has to be here to be able to do that, right? And so we don't want to hold on to everybody at the cost of having nobody in seven months from now. We'd much rather make a hard decision now, you know, regroup and then build around the core team. And maybe we hire back or whatever it may be, but we have to be around and be a good place to work at that's sustainable to really, you know, drive what our employees want. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I think you're speaking, uh, I, I agree with all that wholeheartedly and you're speaking to the fear element, right? So the number one reason why agencies don't make these choices is because again, they think, oh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to shield people from things being bad. I want everybody to think things are rosy and I don't want to tank the culture or whatever. I got news for you. These people are adults. <laughs> they understand how these agencies work. They're not that complicated. And so when they and their colleagues are sitting around and thinking like, I got a bunch of free time on my hands. They're feeling anxious. They're wondering what's going on. They would much rather appreciate having transparent, honest conversations about the situation and even action towards those, even if those mean having to make reductions in staff and, and other things. It's not as if people don't see this happening elsewhere. And it's, it's not as if they're under some delusions that, uh, that, that, that those are impossible at their place. So if you think you're protecting people from this sort of knowledge that maybe things aren't as, as rosy as you had hoped, you're not. Uh, in fact, you're eroding trust by not addressing it. And to, to Sean's point, I think we see a lot of folks dig their age, you know, t dig their agency into a, a deeper hole by taking on debt. Well, first of all, eroding cash reserves, taking on debt and making another, a, a number of other poor financial choices just to hang on to staff. And, and as Sean said, ultimately what you're doing is you're, you're sacrificing everybody for the sake of not sacrificing one or two people, which when, when positioned that way is just silly, short-sighted. Uh, so, it is. It's a natural reaction, but it's silly. Yeah. So Sean, let me ask you this. So that's, so look, with regard to the fear component, like how do you overcome this? I mean, what, what we've basically done here, by the way, is taken a conversation about cost cutting and boiled it down to, hey, 95% of the time, if we're having a cost cutting conversation, it's a people conversation. That's what agencies are made of. They're people. And the, and I get why people don't want to make the, the tough choices about people, but here's why. So to go overcome the fear problem, it, it's just a matter of reframing how you think of the people problem and, and, and realizing that the fears that you've built up in your mind are of your own making. 
Now, to overcome the optimism problem is a little bit trickier. Sean, what would you say, like, how would you suggest an agency owner combat their optimism or balance the optimism of the pipeline against the reality of today's work? Yeah. And, you know, different agency owners are going to have different thresholds for how long we can run at a, you know, a less than desirable margin. So there's going to be a little, a little wiggle room there, but uh, we just need to assign objective, like uh, confidence factors to what we have in a pipeline. So first thing is get a clean pipeline, get a clean way to look at what we have in the pipeline, uh, at, apply a confidence factor, right? So let's look at the rest of, let's say the next quarter and based on what we have sold, what we have in the pipeline, where does that put us? Does that put us at a, you know, an operating profit or a loss? That's going to be the first thing. And then we dig in further, but we need to just get everything out there, build it all out, objectively see in the next couple months, how we're looking, assuming nothing signs. Cause again, we're optimists. Let's say worst case scenario. How does that look in the next three months? If none of that hits, let's scenario plan that now so that we don't make an emotional reaction three months down the line. It's just, setting a plan and holding ourselves accountable to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's totally spot on. I, if I were to add anything, I, I, I mean, again, I, I couldn't agree more with regard to like, well, first of all, write down your pipeline. So a lot of folks are just got it in their head. Uh, I mean, HubSpot's a wonderful CRM for free. If you don't want to use that, just use Excel. doesn't really matter, but make sure you're putting this somewhere and you have stages like, oh, I just had a first conversation. Oh, we had a, they're qualified. Oh, it's a proposal. Like sort of try to segment to where they are in the funnel uh, and then, and, and, you know, as Sean said, you're going to try to put objective percentages against these things. And by the way, the only thing we know about these percentages is that they're going to be wrong. So just be consistent. Quite frankly, I like applying percentages based on stages so that you can't convince yourself, oh, but that conversation was so great. I think this is an 80% chance to close, even though all you had was one 30 minute conversation. That's wild. Just use like, hey, if it's in the first conversation stage, I'm using 20%, regardless of how great that first conversation was. And you know what? The percentage will tick up as they move down the funnel, even if I think that's an inevitability. And then, um, so yeah, you use that. And then I, I think uh, I think another thing I like to do is, is say like, well, look, if I have a utilization problem, right? Like my utilization is, you know, let's say 40% and it needs to be 60, you know, my break even is at 50% and it needs to be 60% in order for me to make any money. Um, then, you know, okay, if it's 40% right now, what's my 90 day utilization number? Like if I take that pipeline, convert it to hours, right? I got these three projects, these many hours, you know, per month, and I throw the percentages on those, how meaningfully does that change? Right. And if these are really high funnel, you know, 10% chance probabilities based on the stage, those aren't going to move the needle that much. And if my current utilization is bad and my 90 day utilization is also not that much better, then you got to make a you got to make a tough choice, and and you know I I often hear like well but then you know I might have to hire again. What a wonderful problem that would be to have. What a wonderful situation we would find ourselves in that we had to let some people go and we find ourselves back in the job market. That is not the wor- That is not a bad scenario. If that's your worst case scenario, you're very blessed. <laughs> so anyway, but yeah, I, th- I think that's how to handle it. Any any anything else you would say in summary relative to this cost cutting topic? No, again, I, we can talk, I could talk for a lot longer about it. Uh, maybe one other thing that comes to mind is, you know, if you are an agency that bills, we have projects and not retainers and we have milestones, let's say, if we're ever not hitting milestones and things are getting delayed and we also have a utilization problem, like that's also a really important thing to understand right now. Like we should be hitting every milestone or overachieving on it uh, at a time where we have not enough work to be signed. So we, I've, I do see that sometimes where, we're still not hitting milestones or whatnot. Like that's got to be uh, project managers really got to be tuned into that when we're cost cutting. All right, Sean. Well, I think, and I agree with those points. By the way, I I think uh, well, <laughs> I think in some ways we took what is a cost cutting conversation and we took it to a very difficult place, and which is which is that of 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 laying people off. And please don't hear us as these heartless people who don't care about the livelihoods of uh, of folks that work on your team. We're we're, we're anything but that, but. Again, we've been in this we've been in this industry long enough, thirteen years, to know that, like as Sean said, this is a people business. People are your number one cost. If you have a cost problem, unfortunately, you have a people problem, and like it or not, you're in the job. You are in the business of matching supply and demand. Supply happens to be people, and so if you don't have enough demand for your supply, there really is only one responsible answer, even if it's not a fun one. Um, so, with that. 
Uh, I will, uh, I, we will adjourn, uh, if you, uh, if you want to learn more about what we do, check us out at upsourceaccounting.com, uh, like, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And until next time.